Welcome to Gospel Perspectives on World History, and I'm your host, Michael Stone. Thank you for joining us as we continue looking at the secular history of the world through the lens of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ. While this uh, podcast is primarily geared towards members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, anyone who has an interest in topics of faith and history are welcome to join us. And as an important legal notice, while I do tend to center what I share as much as possible on the verified details of the historical record and on ancient and modern scriptures approved by the church, I do want to stress that the views I share here do not necessarily represent official doctrine, policy, or the views of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and that I take full responsibility for the content and programming of this podcast. So, after they stumbled around in the fog of illiteracy, ignorance, and anarchy for centuries after the Bronze Age collapse that ended the Mycenaean civilization we talked about in our last episode, we will see how the Greeks experienced a revival of culture beginning about 800 BC uh, that uh, eventually uh, will become the foundation for one of the most impactful and unique civilizations in all of world history as a radical, untested, and revolutionary new form of government was developed for the first time uh, that we know of. Democracy. So, uh, to better understand the development of Greek civilization, it is important to be familiar with the geography of Greece. There are mountains and hills everywhere across the peninsula that makes up uh, both ancient and modern Greece as we know it today. And uh, even a cursory look at a map will tell you that that the Greeks had several places in their domain that could ideally serve as uh, easy ports for trade. And so as was the case for the Mesopotamian peoples and the Egyptians before them, It is difficult to overstate how powerfully these simple details of their geography impacted uh, the way Greeks came to live. For example, even though the many different cities in Greece came to have a a common language, shared religious beliefs, and an otherwise uh, loosely uh, shared culture, these different city-states or uh, polices, that's polis, singular, P-O-L-I-S, they considered themselves to truly be separate peoples, and not one united nation. The reason for this might be easy for the modern audience to understand. If there is one constant in human history, it's that people hate exercise. If you ask me to become friends with someone across the street, that I can probably do. But if you ask me to to, uh, become friends with someone I can only reach by hiking over a mountain... I'll probably tell you to go take a hike yourself. So the fact that Greece is as mountainous as it is also presented another challenge for the people who came to call themselves the Hellenes after the mythical king Helen. While there is a a certain amount of farmland, there is only so much of it before you get before you begin bumping into the less arable or farmable mountainside. And so, uh, as your polis, experiencing this uh, new revival of uh, order and governance after the Dark Ages, it it grows and becomes more populous, each individual farmer is really beginning to feel uh, the squeeze uh, of the geography. And so, there are three different options that a polis could choose from, naturally, in order to solve this problem. Option A, going to war with another polis uh, for their land, was problematic, as defending a polis in this hilly mountainous terrain is much easier than taking over someone else's polis. That's not to say that the attempt was never made. It was simply a less uh, frequently uh, pursued option. Option B for solving the food problem was to use the excellent ports available to your polis to go out and trade for food, or better yet, have your surplus population go out and colonize other areas in the Mediterranean. Option B was much more popular than option A because it didn't involve 
near as many of the same risks as option A and could actually drastically increase the overall prosperity of your polis by expanding your trade network. Of course, the Greeks bumped into the Phoenicians while pursuing option B and in doing so adopted the Phoenician alphabet. The very useful and brilliant innovation the Greeks gave to this alphabet is uh, they, they looked at the Phoenician alphabet and found that they really did not like having zero vowels. Yeah, imagine having an alphabet with no vowels. It makes me uh, think of my mission language of Slovak, where there are actually uh, several things you can say without vowels. For instance, stitch, kurk, skurk, skurk which is kind of a fun tongue twister with the actually scary meaning of stick your finger through the throat. So if you happen to ever feel grateful that as hard as uh, inconsistent as English or many of our other languages that use the Roman alphabet may be, that we at least have vowels and can therefore read our language without having to sound like we are speaking with a finger through your neck. Uh, if you've ever felt that sense of gratitude, you can thank the Greeks for uh, thinking to invent vowels. So anyway, back to the uh, food crisis. The third option a polis could pursue, option C, was to innovate and find better ways to farm the land uh, they already had. Better irrigation, fertilizer, etc. Uh, part of what drove this series of innovations was the burgeoning marketplace in the polis, where both farmers and merchants found all kinds of incentive to outcompete uh, each other. Of course, this new competitive marketplace meant that there were, out of necessity, winners and losers. And sometimes, despite the best efforts by many Greek farmers to win in this uh, Greek version of Monopoly, uh, not everyone always had the luck of being the farmer who happened to have inherited the agricultural equivalent of boardwalk. And uh, so as some farmers and laborers lost in this new marketplace, oftentimes uh, the only way to settle debts was to sell your freedom. Slavery uh, was a commonplace, uh, uh, therefore, uh, throughout Greek history, and perhaps does not get talked about enough as it should, uh, because, yes, we like to focus on the many truly astounding accomplishments of Greece, uh, which are, uh, uh, of course, it, worthy of all the credit they deserve in their own right. But it is also important to remember that while the Greeks did invent the concept of democracy, that the democracy they practiced was a very limited form of democracy, as slaves were most certainly not considered as full and equal citizens uh, in the polis. Even in uh, the most idealistic writings of Greek civilization, like in uh, Plato's Republic, uh, where this philosopher writes of a society uh, governed by enlightened, generous philosopher kings who rule by wisdom and compassion, where citizens are free to pursue their educational interests, to better themselves, uh, uh, the, the question is raised in this work uh, saying, well, yes, this sounds all well and fine, but doesn't someone have to tend to the fields and do the housework and all that stuff? Uh, yeah, Plato's response uh, in the Republic is basically, well, that's why we have slaves. So, uh, yeah, uh, there's that. One other key aspect of uh, Greek life in the polis to understand here, uh, it, it just uh, another limitation to democracy, was that there was another demographic that, except for only in rare circumstances, were uh, completely shut out from public life, and that's women. Whereas the men were allowed to vote, sit on juries, own businesses, own property, inherit property, go and see the Olympic Games, women were rarely seen outside the home and forbidden from doing any of those things that the men could. And when I say forbidden, I mean to say that they would be put to death if they crossed uh, some of those lines. And for the modern student of history, that can seem especially draconian. But again, the Greeks were a people who literally believed Pandora was real and that uh, Helen of Troy was real. They sincerely believed that women were to blame for the world's ills. And therefore, they felt that shutting them away into their homes was not only justified, but safe. And when I say shut away, I mean so very literally. Greek homes 
were locked from the outside, after all. So, uh, yes, uh, for those, lis- uh, for those uh, listening to the podcast, uh, uh, for those uh, of you women who might not mind being a homemaker, could you imagine a life as a Greek homemaker where you are locked inside your own home every day? I mean, it's not like Greek husbands necessarily cared whether or not their wives had a social life or not. One way for women to circumvent some of these restrictions, however, was if they were involved in some of the uh, cults of the time, Uh, one being the cult of Athena. This is a group of priestesses who made up the clergy of the religion surrounding the patron deity of Greece's most famous polis, Athens. So if you were a priestess, you could participate in public life to a much greater extent. Uh, Of course, uh, the number of women who did ultimately get accepted into their ranks were few in number uh, compared to the rest who were just locked in their homes. There are records of a number of uh, other cults, however, with much less uh, savory reputations than the cult of Athena uh, that were other options for these women. Uh, Where in these other options, women belonging to these other cults would go out during the night to revel and feast together. Men who strayed across these gatherings uh, of these women-only parties uh, were, uh, to put it mildly, these men did not leave in one piece, uh, if at all. Moral of the story I take from that, when my wife says she wants time to chat with her friends or to go out to eat with her sisters or others, I let her. That's my 11th commandment. Thou shalt not interfere with thy wife's social life. So, I... Given that there were uh, some of these restrictions put in place for how democracy worked in Greece, how did democracy actually work uh, for those who could participate in it? Well, it's uh, actually uh, quite different than the way it works in most every democratic country today. And uh, to show that, I'm going to take a closer look at Athens in particular as their democracy is fairly representative of a number of the other styles of self-governance we see in many of the polices. So, uh, for you see, whereas today in America, for example, we live in a representative democracy, where the voters choose representatives to go write and vote on laws for them, the Greeks instead had a direct democracy. That is, the male, free, property-owning, and purely Greek, that is, non-foreign citizens of the polis, would be invited about uh, 10 times a year or so uh, to sit down together and vote on specific laws. Now, not everyone is going to attend, of course, but thousands often did. This form of direct democracy cemented the idea that uh, those men who were free uh, uh, Greeks uh, were all equals. And that as fully-fledged citizens in a polis, they all deserved to have a say in how it was governed. And uh, the Greeks were especially proud of their democracy. And in my opinion, uh, fairly rightfully so. While it is not great that women were shut out and they did have slaves, Greek democracy was definitely a step forward, I think, in letting people govern themselves. And to that extent... It is something worth celebrating. Democracy, literally meaning a rule by the people, is, after all, something that has a a, a special role for Latter-day Saints. Uh, It it, it takes, uh, for example, a significant status in the history of the Book of Mormon. Uh, For example, beginning uh, beginning in uh, Mosiah chapter 29, when monarchy is done away among the Nephites. And King Mosiah instead sets up a democracy for the Nephites to govern themselves by with a system of judges to help maintain it. After explaining how the system of monarchy itself can uh, present very difficult challenges for a people in case of there being a wicked king and how hard it can be to remove uh, a said king and how easy it is for a wicked king to unduly influence his people to live unrighteously, uh, Mormon records the people's response in verse 38 as, therefore, they relinquished their desires for a king, and became exceedingly anxious that every man should have an equal chance throughout all the land. 
Yea, and every man expressed a willingness to answer for his own sins. And I have uh, always been powerfully impressed uh, by that verse. The Book of Mormon, therefore, introduces what I think is a quintessential counterpart to the liberty that a democratic government provides. And that important counterpart is responsibility. Because although I have personally found that secular discussions of democracy often like to end with the idea that, well, democracy is a superior form of government because it allows people to govern themselves. And that's its own inherent good. The Book of Mormon takes this one very necessary, one vital step further. It is not enough that people govern themselves. It is not enough that we simply have our own voice. For democracy to truly work and to provide the best possible outcomes for the most amount of people, we must be responsible participants in democracy. Which, I suppose, leads uh, to the natural question that follows, it, what does that responsibility look like? Elder Oaks, in his April 2021 uh, talk, Defending Our Divinely Inspired Constitution, it gave, I think, a good answer to this question, and I'll quote him. We must uh, pray for the Lord to guide and bless all nations and their leaders. This is part of our article of faith. Being subject to presidents or rulers, of course, poses no obstacle to our opposing individual laws or policies. It does require that we exercise our influence civilly and peacefully within the framework of our constitutions and applicable laws. On contested issues, we should seek to moderate and unify. There are other duties that are part of upholding the inspired constitution. We should learn and advocate the inspired principles of the constitution. We should seek out and support wise and good persons who will support those principles in their public actions. We should be knowledgeable citizens who are active in making our influence felt in civic affairs. Close quote. So, consider for a moment just how profound Elder Oaks was in this talk. And he does mention in there that while he does focus his remarks on the American Constitution, that Many of the principles he discusses apply to any uh, uh, of the democracies around the world. Um, yeah, it, just take a look at what uh, he is advocating for here. Moderation, unity, civility, peace. Compare that to much of what the louder part of the world is advocating for. Extremism, division, and often uh, pettiness and cruelty. I feel I just cannot recommend reading Elder Oaks's full talk enough, especially for those of us living in America during this particular presidential election year. And seeing as we do not live in ancient Greece anymore, allowing everyone, including women and other citizens who might be considered uh, to be minorities in society, as after all, Latter-day Saints like myself, are a minority. Uh, we want to give everyone that equal voice, an equal chance to participate in a democracy and safeguarding that right to participate is a vital responsibility for anyone uh, who uh, truly values democracy. So, back to Greek uh, democracy. It, uh, it has one very interesting feature to it that we really don't have uh, in the modern-day democracies uh, it, to anywhere to the same extent uh, the Greeks had it. For there were several times in Greek history where wealthier citizens, uh, called the eristoi, and the more common citizens, uh, uh, the kakoi, uh, were not able to resolve their differences peaceably. In these cases where the threat of civil war was actually quite real, the Greeks would choose one among them to become an autocrat, a, a dictator, uh, or by their own word, a tyrant. Now, the word tyrant today 
has a very uh, sour aftertaste in our mouths, and I would argue for very good reason. Thank you, King George III. What you may not know, though, is that the Greeks did not see tyrants that way, uh, necessarily, uh, especially in the case of the Athenians. Solon, uh, uh, for example, uh, was one such uh, Athenian tyrant who took this uh, emergency position in Athens in 594 BC to prevent a civil war between the rich and the poor. He himself, despite being quite wealthy, promised to write and enforce laws that would benefit everyone in the polis. Interestingly enough, he was actually also a poet, and he used that talent to write songs about his policies to introduce them to the people. Can you imagine for a moment how neat that would be uh, if today's lawmakers did that? How neat would it be if we had them compose their policy suggestions into poetry and had them sing those uh, for us? I tell you this, I'd be a lot more interested in watching the State of the Union addresses if that was the case. Uh, uh, anyways, uh, regarding Solon, one of the first things he did was he forgave all debts that Athenians owed to each other. He also decided to forbid any Athenian from being sold into slavery to pay off their debts. Now, as uh, radical as those policies may have been, they did have one very important effect for Athens at that time. And that was the farmers who were drowning in debt all of a sudden didn't have to worry about becoming slaves. Uh, these farmers then no longer had the desire to rebel uh, against the elite class, and they were free to go back to doing what they wanted to do in the first place, and what, the, uh, and what uh, Athens kind of needed them to do at the end of the day, which was simply to farm. Solon also decided to institute a representative form of an executive branch uh, for a time in Athens, where 400 representatives randomly chosen from each of Athens' ten tribes, which included rich and poor alike, would serve. Solon also created, for one of the very first times in history, the concept of juries, of being judged by a group of your peers instead of just uh, uh, some judge uh, uh, by themselves. And so Solon's reforms, as helpful as they were, were not enough to completely get rid of all the unrest. A relative of his, uh, Pisistratus, seized power through force of arms and became another very popular despot by patching some of the weaknesses he and others saw in Solon's reforms. Uh, he emphasized, for example, the importance of the common religious festivals Athenians celebrated to kind of get that social glue uh, in there to help people feel more united. And he also helped the farmers uh, that uh, uh, he, uh, th that is, and Pisistratus also helped the farmers that Solon helped reincorporate into Athenian society by granting them back some of the land that had been earlier taken by their uh, wealthier peers. Pisistratus's sons uh, tried uh, to keep going on as tyrants, but ultimately were deposed when Cleisthenes, uh, that's a, a, an Athenian nobleman uh, at the time, convinced the Spartans to help get rid of them, as uh, Pisistratus's sons were not near as popular as their father had been. The Spartans did not, however, include Cleisthenes in the new government, leading him to finally turn to the common farmers in Attica to help support him. As he promised to let the, the Dems, that, that, that's the Greek word for common people living in the villages, uh, to rule. Uh, and so inviting the, the, the Dems to rule literally a, a democracy uh, is what he's proposing. His solution to helping more Greeks to have a voice in governance was to expand the previous Council of 400 uh, to 500, making it so that not only did each individual Greek citizen have a better chance at being heard through this council uh, in the executive branch of government, you could say, but that also meant that those who represented them in these councils couldn't just play the it's my way or the highway card uh, as they uh, enforced legislation. That That is they would have to come together and compromise. 
moderate and work together. And that, I would argue, is the secret sauce in the recipe for a successful democracy. To realize that you will never get 100% of everything you want uh, in a democracy. But if you are willing to give a little here, to concede on a few points there, you may find that the other side uh, will also be willing to compromise. And therefore, everyone will at least get a few parts of what they want. Compromise, uh, a word that sometimes I am surprised to see such a, uh, get such a bad rap uh, in today's politics, is the essential ingredient to any style of successful governance in democracies today. So, after all these reforms from these tyrants, they ended up actually leaving Athens a much more stable democracy than what they had in the first place. Very counterintuitive. Uh, and of course, there were several uh, bumps along the way, but at the end of the day, these tyrants often are remembered quite well uh, in history for their contributions to preserving the ultimate uh, liberty uh, of many of the Greeks. Oh, if only all the other tyrants in history were like that, huh? So, there is one other polis in Greece that probably deserves closer inspection uh, just because it is so very different than many of the other polises at the time. Uh, Sparta, of course, is another popularly remembered polis, and it might have something to do with the fact that uh, so many movies are made about it. I will confess I have not seen the movies, so I, I can't tell you much about how accurate or inaccurate they may be. But I can tell you the real story of what life in Sparta was like. The short version, be grateful you didn't live there and then, is all I can say. Uh, the Spartans had a very different approach to finding a way to uh, successfully live with the limited amount of farmland that they had. Yes, uh, they pursued option A, warfare, but it was with a big asterisk. It was very different than what uh, the other polices would do. When the Spartans go to war, they would enslave the people they defeated in battle and then would force them to be perpetual slaves to work the land that they conquered for the Spartans. And these slaves actually had it tougher than any other slaves in ancient Greece because while there was a real possibility of other slaves outside of Sparta buying their own freedom, uh, if you were a Spartan slave, you were doomed to servitude your whole life. And what's worse, so were your children's, 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 children for all time. So, if you were most people in Sparta, you were a slave that had a pretty bleak outlook on life. So, uh, how did Sparta control all these slaves, though? By having probably the most insanely psychotic, intense, militaristic culture out of anyone else we have talked about in this podcast. They didn't fool around with having something as silly as a democracy. <laughs> uh, and instead, they decided to rule by oligarchy. Uh, literally, uh, rule by the few, the elite. Uh, which is, they had the elderly rich in their society rule as a group over the rest of their culture. And boy, oh boy, did these oligarchs have some uh, unique perspectives on how to make their culture as maniacally militaristic as it ended up being. Uh, well, uh, for one, there's the agoge, the very unique and uh, frankly creepy educational system the Spartans used. Uh, childhood for the Spartans, because of the system, uh, to woefully understate it, it was tough. For one, uh, parents from the 
earliest days of their children would train their kids to imagine a different way to die each night as they went to sleep. <laughs> yeah. Uh, at age seven, boys were taken away from their parents by the state to receive their education 24 hours a day and seven days a week away from their parents. For years, they wouldn't see their parents again and they would just be trained by the state. And so to train these boys to grow up to be tough and clever, they purposefully gave these kids very little to eat, forcing these children to fight each other for scraps or to learn to be uh, clever and to steal from each other. They were also allowed no clothes to protect them from the elements, except for one cloak during the winter time, uh, so they wouldn't die. Uh, <laughs> and these kids were regularly and ritualistically beaten in order to quite literally help them develop thick skins and to become physically tough. At age 18, after all of these years of malnutrition and abuse and terror and violence, uh, these 18-year-olds were then essentially given the Spartan version of boot camp. That's when they would actually begin training them to be soldiers. And after two years of this intense uh, training, they uh, were they would graduate and just be some of the toughest Mina sons of guns you'd never want to cross. And uh, for the girls out there, though, it's, it's not as if the Spartans let women uh, off the hook. They were taught by their family to also learn how to fight and kill, as they were considered to be the reserve guard at home to protect the homeland. They're soldiers as well. And... I suppose in this weird, twisted way, the Spartans actually were more fair than the Athenians. They actually respected their women more. Women, uh, they were supposed to be just as tough as their husbands, and often were the ones who were in charge of running the business of their slave-run plantations while their husbands were away doing their military service. And just in case I haven't driven the point home enough yet, that these Spartans were uh, tough as nails, I should probably mention their signature dish, black soup. I should stress here that the black soup I am about to describe was real. There are dozens and dozens of accounts of this soup from a variety of sources. Anyone who knew Sparta during this time in the ancient world knew about the soup and, and, and hated it for good reason. This soup was what the Spartans liked to feed their children and soldiers to eat for their meals. It was boiled pork meat and pork blood, with only salt and vinegar for seasoning. Now, you'd think that with all the slaves Sparta had, they could have just had their servants cook up something nicer for them. But that that's not what the Spartans are about. They weren't about luxury or comfort. They literally invented the stuff, this black soup for their soldiers to eat, so they would not have to fear death. <laughs> and uh, I'll, I'll just add one other little detail about Spartan life before we close. And it's a story that gets told by uh, Plutarch, a Roman writer, who in 42 AD was describing the Spartan people by recounting something that Spartan mothers often told their children. Spartan mothers... Uh, often were said to tell their sons before they would go off to the Agoj to either uh, return with their shields or on them. And so this quote does need a little explanation uh, uh, for the modern reader. The hoplites, or the soldiers of the Greek armies, had very heavy, durable shields. And if you fell in battle, the shield you were carrying... It could very well be used as a stretcher to carry your corpse home with. Of course, if you came home with your shield instead of being on your shield, that would be even better, of course. But coming home with your shield or on your shield for the Spartans was infinitely preferable than coming home without your shield. 
because then that meant that you had dropped it, that you had run away from the battle. So quite literally, when those Spartan moms told their sons, come home with it or on it, they were quite literally telling them, don't you come home running to me, expecting me to love and forgive you if you run away from war. You are literally worse than dead to me if you ever run away from your duty to fight and kill for Sparta. So, uh, to that whole mindset, though there is definitely a part of me that is fascinated by that complete 100% devotion to a cause, I cannot help but remember a phrase from 2 Nephi chapter 2. The Spartans, as rigid and as tough as they were, I believe, missed out on perhaps one of the single biggest purposes in life. Certainly as Latter-day Saints, we should not be allergic to work or to accomplishing important goals. But as Nephi said in that chapter, men are, and I would say women too, we are that we might have joy. Heavenly Father did not intend this life to simply be the somber march of a joyless soldier. When he invites us to keep his commandments, it is not to exercise control over us, but rather to invite us to live a more happy, fulfilling, and uh, enjoyable life. The commandments really are for us. Life really is meant to be enjoyed. And though there are also trials, tribulations, and adversities that are a necessary part of life, I think it is important to remember that even Jesus took breaks. Even he rested. Sometimes in our culture, especially where uh, corporatism is involved, uh, being called a workaholic uh, is often seen as a badge of honor. But when we sacrifice our own mental health, our time with family, our physical health, or other important elements of living a a, a truly meaningful, fulfilling life uh, in order to better our careers, I believe it is then that some people will uh, realize too late what David O. McKay meant uh, when he said, no other success can replace failure in the home. A person is more than their profession. And I will furthermore offer my own opinion that where we as Latter-day Saints do happen to be in the position of being an employer, hopefully we take the time to remember that having a healthy, educated, and happy workforce that feels trusted, valued, and respected is just as important, if not more important, than having a healthy bottom line. Otherwise, we may end up scratching our heads in confusion, asking why everyone is complaining about the black soup. And uh, that concludes our discussion for today about archaic uh, Greece. We will move forward in uh, Greek history next time to the classical period as we get to uh, the height of uh, Greek uh, culture, uh, at least in the peninsula, as some of the civilization's greatest minds uh, come to make their mark on history. Uh, This is also a time where the greatest foe for the Greeks ever will emerge on the horizon. Uh, A civilization we haven't talked for A civilization we've not talked about for some time, uh, but will threaten the rest of the tapestry of history should their ambitions for Greece ever be realized. And that would be none other than the Persian Empire, fresh from having conquered Babylon, Syria, and even mighty Egypt, led by the the, uh, cunning king Xerxes led by the cunning King Xerxes. In the face of Persia, will the Greek city-states, so different as they are, be able to unite? 
even polices as different as Sparta and Athens, well, you'll have to stay tuned uh, for next week. Also, if you've enjoyed this podcast, be sure to leave us a review. And if you know others who would enjoy this series, please consider sharing it with them. Uh, One easy way to do that, use the link in the episode description for our show's website and share that on your ward's uh, social media page so that other members of the church can enjoy the show as well. I would like uh, to thank everyone who supported the launch of this podcast, including my lovely wife, my kids, and my loving brother-in-law, Spencer, for suggesting that I go through with this idea. And again, thank you for listening, and stay safe out there. Thank mm-hmm. you.